there, so this is lecture eight in our Vietnam series. LBJ called 1968 a nightmare year. Sounds familiar, right? One major moment in American history was the protest that happened at the Democratic National Convention. You know, Robert F. Kennedy was supposed to be our next presidential nominee, but he was assassinated three months prior before the convention. So nobody was really excited about the Democratic nominee because the one guy that we loved was shot in the head, just like um, his brother. The Democratic National Convention, Chicago, August 1968. The country deeply divided. The war in Vietnam claiming hundreds of American lives every week. The convention was a disaster waiting to happen. How do you do with happiness? The Democratic contenders were Vice President Hubert Humphrey. Robert Kennedy had been killed just three months earlier. At the DNC in Chicago, thousands of protesters descended outside of the DNC. The mayor, he was going to do whatever he could to maintain that peace. Mayor Richard Daley vowed to keep it peaceful, even if it took force to keep the peace. He was backed by 12,000 police, 5,000 National Guardsmen, 7,500 regular army troops. So a question I have for you is, if you have that much police and military force trying to quell the crowds, will that actually make the crowd calmer? It was also a mess inside. On day two, a Vietnam peace initiative failed to pass. Angry delegates demonstrated. until the house band was ordered to drown them out. Daly fiercely defended his police department and famously misspoke in the process. Gentlemen, get the thing straight once and for all. The policeman isn't there to create disorder. The policeman is there to preserve disorder. So 1968 is one hell of a year in American history. We have a lot happening. The Tet Offensive, Martin Luther King was assassinated, Robert F. Kennedy is assassinated, and then you have this thing happening in front of the DNC. All of these events are going to open the door for a Nixon presidency. All set? Yes, sir. We'll see you downtown, fellas. Just days later, Richard Nixon opened his campaign in Chicago and was welcomed with a ticker tape parade. He promised law and order. And that November, a nation still deeply divided narrowly elected him president of the United States. He won because he spoke to the silent majority and he ran with the message of law and order. And with all of these things happening, his message of law and order will really resonate with this group of people. So because we are talking about Vietnam, let's go ahead and get into Nixon's Vietnam policy. Nixon is going to promise peace with honor. His de-escalation plan is called Vietnamization. And the idea is that we are going to take our boys out of this war and put the war effort in the hands of the South Vietnamese. But instead of doing that, he's going to secretly expand the war with the hopes of making it smaller, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. In the spring of 1969, American B-52s had begun the secret bombing of neutral Cambodia. These top secret military cables, obtained under the Freedom of Information Act, were part of a cover-up that was the real beginning of Watergate. The pilots were sworn not to tell even their superiors, and their logs were falsified. The official aim of the bombing was to wipe out a Viet Cong base in Cambodia, a base that existed only in the imagination of American generals. President Nixon's aim was to show the Vietnamese communists just how tough he could be, a policy he once described as the madman theory of war. Unfortunately, these U.S. bombings will have major consequences, and that major consequence will be a civil war in Cambodia where the communists will do horrific things to the civilians. And that's a history you should definitely check out. It's called the Kumar Rouge. In the meantime, we have a former military analysis, Daniel Ellsberg, who is a personal hero of mine. Daniel Ellsberg copies thousands of Defense Department documents. Proof the U.S. government was lying about its role in the Vietnam War. Ellsberg exposes that lie to the world. These top secret documents are called the Pentagon Papers. 
When most people think of the Vietnam War, they think of LBJ, but no, 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 no. As you have learned through these videotapes, it goes way back. As early as 1950, the Truman administration gave military aid to France against the Viet Minh. In 1954, President Eisenhower sent aircraft and military assistance to Vietnam. By that time, the U.S. was covering 80% of France's military expenses in Indochina. President Kennedy adopted a policy of broad commitment to the war in Vietnam, even though the American people had been told the U.S. involvement would be very limited. Then, President Lyndon B. Johnson waged military operations against North Vietnam. He began planning war in 1964, a full year before the depth of U.S. involvement was revealed to the public. The New York Times has started publication of a series of reports based on a top-secret Pentagon study of the Vietnam War. The central fact so far revealed is that there was a massive deception of the American public for starting the bombing of North Vietnam. Hey, stop it! Ellsberg was walled off by a mob of newsmen and supporters as he admitted that he was indeed the man who brought the Pentagon Papers to the press and congressional leaders. I can no longer cooperate in concealing this information from the American public. Dr. Ellsberg, you have any concern about the possibility of going to prison for this? Quick plan. Wouldn't you go to prison to tell us on this war? So, although the Pentagon Papers will heavily criticize the other presidents, it will be Nixon who takes on the fight. Nixon, like pretty much every president, hates whistleblowers. And Nixon really hates the fact that Daniel Ellsberg leaked these documents. Nixon saw it as a threat to his presidency. This is a devastating security breach that was leaked out of the Pentagon. The most highly classified documents of the war. He's a fellow that worked over this Ellsberg who worked in the Defense Department, and by golly, we're going to get him, and he's going to go to jail. In Oval Office recordings, the sound of Nixon's angry voice charging at Daniel Ellsberg. Hello, this is Mr. President. I just say that we've got to keep our eye on the main ball. The main ball is Ellsberg. we got to get this son of a bitch. And uh, it, just because some guy's going to be a martyr uh, of allowing the fellow to get away with this kind of wholesale thievery, or otherwise it's going to happen all over the government. He's signing his death warrant as a president. He's signing his impeachment warrant. Right. We've got to have a united front on Ellsberg. That's the main thing. Possibly the more intriguing tale is that Ellsberg had copied a second set of documents, government plans for nuclear war. What was in the nuclear papers that, that haunted you? The estimates by the Joint Chiefs of how many they would kill if we initiated nuclear war. And what was the estimate? The estimate amounted to, in total, 600 million dead. It's multi-genocide. Uh, it's a hundred holocausts. Another incident that fell under Nixon's presidency was the Kent State shootings on May 4th, 1970, where four students were shot dead and nine others were wounded. After students heard about Nixon expanding the war in Cambodia, the anti-protesters took to the streets. And not only did they take to the streets, these protesters took to the campuses. In Ohio, at Kent State, a protest occurred on May 1st. On May 1st, the day after Nixon's announcement, two peaceful rallies were held at Kent State University in Kent, Ohio. Now that group was dispersed and all those students went to the bars on Main Street and they drank their beers and they complained about the government and about the man and whatever. Uh, but there were some skirmishes between some students and protesters and the police. The mayor freaked out and said, you know what, I'm closing all the bars. And so what happens when you close all the bars? What happens to all the people in those bars who are angry about what the government had done? And then the local government does something like this. Where are they going to go? They're going to go onto the streets. Later that night, drunken revelers in downtown began pushing over garbage cans, lighting fires, and breaking store windows. On the following day, the mayor and the governor are real concerned about these agitators Kent Mayor Leroy Satrum declared a civil emergency and called in the Ohio National Guard, worried that violence would erupt again. Some radicals decided upon themselves to go to campus and burn down the ROTC building. On May 4th, another protest was scheduled for around 11 a.m. 
Now, the protesters were peacefully protesting. Most of them were just kind of watching. Some of them were chanting. A lot of them were just sitting on the grass, but they were still ordered to disperse. And the National Guard starts moving in, pushing these kids further back. They push them so far back that some of them get upset and they start throwing rocks and sticks and stones. For whatever reason, your finger gets a little itchy. Maybe you pull the trigger and that's what happened. 70 shots were fired. Four died, nine were wounded. Open fire. After the incident, Newsweek published an article with a famous photo of a 14-year-old runaway kneeling over one of the students who had been shot and killed. This photo would become a symbol of the climate of America during the Vietnam War. And I hate to bring race into it, but race is in every story in our American history. But these were four kids who were from white, middle-class homes. This is going to shock Americans. They're used to seeing images of minorities fighting back, but to have one of their own shoot one of their own, well, that's a different story for a lot of Americans, unfortunately. 